Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress with number 4 in the series We're Standing on the Shoulders of Giants from Rui Lopez to Magnus Carlsen. These 12 players were the strongest players of their era and the first 5 names there were covered in the first 3 videos from this series Rui Lopez de Segura, Leonardo da Cotri, Paulo Boy, Alessandro Salvio and Giacchino Greco you can find those videos in the playlist. This video is about Legal de Camer and François André Danican Philidor, and in future videos we go to Alexandre de Chapelle, de La Bardonnay, Staunton, Anderson, and the great Paul Morphy. Then we move on to the official world champions Steinitz, Lasker, Capablanca, Aljochin, Oeve, Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tal, Petrojan. Spassky, Bobby Fischer, Karpov, Kasparov, Kramnik, Anand, and the current world champion Magnus Carlsen. Back to the first list, as you can see between Greco and the Kermur there is about 100 years of a difference. The center of the chess world moved from Italy to France. It's not clear who was the strongest player of their era in those 100 years, so that's why we have that gap. Legal de Camer was seen as the strongest player between 1730 and 1755 and let's find out a bit more about that man. This is what he looked like, friendly smile. He was born in 1702 and died in 1792 at almost 19 years old which was of course very old for that, for that era. Along with other famous players he played in the center of the chess world which was the Café de la Régence in Paris in France. And he's considered to have been the strongest player in the world from around 1730 to 1755. He taught his successor Philidor to play chess and lost a match against him in 1755. Only one game of the Camer has been preserved and that was against Saint-Brie played in 1750 in the Café de la Régence and in this game we see the famous mate that is named after the Kremer. Let's have a look at that game. e4, the Kremer is white, e5 from Saint-Brie, knight f3, d6, that is what was called later the Philidor defense, bishop c4, bishop g4, Knight c3, and now black has a number of good moves. Develop the knight to f6 or develop the knight to c6. They are both good moves, but Saint-Brie blunders here. He plays g6, and now we have the famous move knight takes e5. Sacrificing the queen. But if you take the queen, then there is bishop takes f7 check, king e7, and knight d5 checkmate, which is called Legal's mate after Legal de Camer. Let's go back to knight takes e5. Okay, you cannot take the queen, but if you take the knight, then there is queen takes g4, and you've lost the pawn with black, white. As an overwhelming position already. It's a pity that no other games of Legal de Camer have been preserved. This game is the only one. It's not sure of course if this was a real game or if this was a composition by Legal de Camer to show this famous mate. Anyway, his name lives on in the chess world with Legal's mate. Let's move to the seventh giant and that's François-André Danican Philidor, and this is what he looked like. He was born in 1726, died in 1795. Apart from a chess player, he was also a composer of music and one of the founders of the French comic opera. One famous quote from Philidor is, the pawns are the soul of chess. And his actual words were, they are the soul of chess it is they which uniquely determine the attack and defense and on their good or bad arrangement depends entirely the winning or losing of the game. 
He's also famous for the book he wrote on chess, Analyse du jeu des échecs, was considered a standard chess manual for at least a century. The tragedy was that Philidor was too far ahead of his time, and that's a quote I got from Garry Kasparov's book My Great Predecessors, because nobody could play in the positional manner proposed by him. The chess world was not ready yet for the general principles of positional play. For more than half of the 19th century, the romantic trend of the Italian school dominated. Let's look at one of Philidor's games. He played this as black against Captain Smith. Again, it's not sure if this was a real game or if it was a game that was composed by Philidor. It's supposed to have been played in London as a blindfold game, which probably means that only Philidor was blindfolded on the 13th of March 1790. Let's have a look. Captain Smith opened e4 and Philidor played e5. Bishop c4, knight f6, d3, c6 to prepare the d7, d5 push. Bishop g5, h6. Here on this move, d5 was an alternative. Captain Smith decided to take on f6, give the bishop pair. Philidor took with the queen and knight c3. By giving the bishop pair, white has stopped black playing the d7, d5 move. But he played b5, bishop b3 and a5, grabbing space. And we can see here Philidor convinced that the pawns are the soul of chess. He's pushing his pawns. a3 to make a square for the bishop. Bishop c5, knight f3 d6, queen d2, bishop e6, white took on e6 and Philidor took back with the pawn. From his book Analyse du jeu des échecs, Analyse du jeu des échecs, I quote, it's always advantageous to exchange your f-pawn for the e-pawn since this leads to the seizure of the center and in addition to the opening of a file for a rook. Of course here it was not the f-pawn that got swapped for the e-pawn, but the principle is the same. Black now has an extra pawn in the center and a half open f-file for a rook. f takes e6 is much stronger than queen takes e6. White castled, g5, h3, knight d7, knight h2. That's not a great move. Knight e2 to prepare the b2 b4 move is better. White really has to develop counterplay on the queen side. But knight h2 was played. h5, g3. The idea behind that move is if Philidor now plays h4, then white can play g4 and keep. The position closed. King e7 from Philidor, the king is safe in the center as white does not have any counterplay or a center breakthrough. And this king now makes room for the rook on a8. King g2 from Captain Smith, d5, f3, knight f8. Black is rerouting the knight. Knight e2. Knight g6, c3, rook a g8, d4, bishop went to b6, and Captain Smith played d takes e5 to get the d4 square for his knight. Queen took back, knight d4, king d7 to protect the c6, c6 pawn. Rook ae1, h4, and now g3 is attacked. And here white should have played f4. And after g takes f4, play knight g4, attacking the queen, for example, queen c7, and then g takes f4, and the position is roughly equal. 
but he did not play f4, he played queen f2, that's a bad move. Here Philidor could have crashed through straight away with h takes d3, queen takes, knight f4 check, king h1, and rook takes h3, and black is winning. Instead he played bishop c7, attacking g3 once again. That pawn is now attacked three times and Captain Smith decides to defend it once more with the knight, knight e2, which is too passive a defense. Why should have tried to get some play starting with knight g4? Knight e2 is too passive. Philidor took on g3, queen takes, queen takes, knight takes. The queen exchange does not slow down black's attack at all. Knight f4 check, king h1, rook takes h3, and rook g1 to protect the knight on g3. But there comes the final combination, rook takes h2 check, king has to take, rook h8 check, knight h5 is the only move, rook takes, king g3, knight h3 with a discover check and now white could have prolonged the game somewhat by playing king g2 then black takes on g1 king takes and rook h2 and black is just a piece up and easily winning but he played instead of king g2 he played king g4 and there was a nice checkmate with rook h4 very nice win, especially as this was a blindfold game by François André Danican Filidor, the seventh world champion in history. One final position I want to show you, because Filidor's name also lives on in a rook end game. The method to defend a rook end game a pawn down has been named after him. This is an example. Black is playing for a win, he has an extra pawn, but the Philidor defense is for white to stay on the third rank till the pawn gets pushed to that same rank. So if black is to move here and he plays rook b2, then white just marks time, rook c3 stays on the third rank, rook a2, rook b3, and if then black decides to take action and play e3, threatening king f3 with checkmate motives. Then, only then, does the rook go to the 8th rank with rook b8. And if black then plays king f3, white gives checks from behind. Rook f8 check, king e4, rook e8 check, king f4, rook f8 check, king e5, rook e8 check, and the king has to go back Black cannot make progress, this game is a draw. So to sum up the defense, the defender should keep his king in front of the opposing pawn and keep his rook on the third rank until the pawn advances to that rank. Then go to the far end of the board, the seventh or the eighth rank, and check the king from behind. This drawing maneuver was found by Philidor and it still carries his name. Hope you enjoyed this video on Legal de Camer and François André Danican Filidor. As you can see, next time we will go to the 19th century with Alexandre de Chapelle. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel. I'm looking forward to your comments, and if you liked the video, it would be great if you could share it on YouTube. You also may want to check out my Chess to Progress channel. The link is in the description box. This is Rick from Chess to Impress. Thank you very much for watching.